This is Rachel Cunningham, and you're listening to Joyful Love, episode 107. If you're ready to bring joy and connection back to your marriage, stick around. Each week, I give you the tools to up-level your thinking, open your heart, and bring joy and fun back to your relationship. Because it's not enough just to stay married. We want to love being married. Hello, friends. Today, I have another amazing coach as a guest on the podcast. Her name is Corey Woods, and she is a divorce coach. Now, we talk about a wide range of things on this podcast, usually geared toward the woman who wants to stay married, but just wants to have a better marriage with the one she's with. However, over the years, I've been more and more aware of the many listeners who are just trying to figure out what is best for them personally to stay in their relationship or to go. So when I met Corey about a year ago, I fell in love with the way she shares her heart and wisdom, specifically on divorce. She's been there and done it, and she has kids and she is doing it beautifully. And I knew that I wanted to share her wisdom with you. So friends, enjoy this conversation on Divorce with Corey Woods. Corey Woods, it is so nice to have you on my podcast. So before we go into our discussion, I want to just read something that I read on your Facebook wall today, and then we're going to dive in, if that's okay with you. Yes. (laughs) Okay. You have a post in there that says, it, it talks about what divorce coaching is, like what is divorce coaching? And you said, you listed a bunch of things. I'm going to read them right now. You said, how to get over your ex, how to make money, how to not be triggered, how to single parent and adjust to this new norm, how and when to date, how to develop new friendships, how to have conversations with your ex, conflict resolution, processing emotions, especially grief, learning deep levels of acceptance, telling your story, and letting go of the story your ex has about you. When I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good and so incredibly needed. And we were just talking before, before we started recording the the podcast about how half of my audience, like I'm a marriage coach. I teach people how to heal their relationships and have an incredible marriage. And half of my audience is in a position where they are trying to figure out, is divorce the right answer or not? And that's where you come in. You are a divorce coach. So welcome to my podcast, Corey Woods. Thank you. This is going to be fun. Yeah. (laughs) It's a good topic to consider. And if I could say one thing, I know we have lots to cover Mm -hmm. around it, but I feel like knowing that there is an option for divorce is what makes your yes in your marriage so powerful. Mm, I love that. A lot of people forget that piece, like because divorce is such a taboo and scary topic to even discuss. Yeah. Thanks for having me. (laughs) You are so welcome. I would, I would love to dive into that piece a little bit later, but tell me, first of all, what led you to this work? Well, I've been a coach for five years, so it's, I've had a few different niches and I started coaching after my fifth child was born and I experienced such a level of growth when I experienced coaching for myself and decided it fe- it felt more like a god calling so i started with you know general life coaching and i started doing money coaching and then i coached coaches on how to grow their business and i was navigating all of these niches but i was still coaching on the same thing mm-hmm. and so what got me into divorce coaching is when i divorced my ex-husband i felt like my source you know, I give it a few different names. Sometimes I refer to it as God or my inner wisdom Mm -hmm. just knew, like I knew, I knew that I needed to heal with intention. And I didn't know that that would then lead me to help others, you know, because now that I'm in the single world, I'm like, there is so much suffering outside on and on the other side of divorce, just as a lot of people experience, you know, sometimes in their marriage. And so I kind of just looked at my process and I'm like, I know how to help people like, Mm -hmm. and how to heal with intention, because when you heal with by accident, so I like to call it like kind of by accident, 
you have this like very mediocre experience of life. But when I, when you add intention with behind it, I feel like that's where the extraordinary piece comes in. Right. And so, yeah, so I kind of took my own process, which is probably not entirely new in and of itself, but wanting to then help people navigate their life post-divorce or even as they're going through the divorce process. Was there any specific turning point for you personally in your divorce journey where you were, you know, had that wake up call to intentionally heal? You know, I had already, I had done probably three years worth of self-work, what what I refer to. So before I actually made that decision, I had already sought individual counseling. We had done marriage counseling. I had hired every coach known to man, right? Business coach, marriage coach. So I had already done a lot of the work on myself. So when I actually came to make the decision, it was very clear that it was time to go. And I had spent, I wish there was just like one pivotal moment. There was one pivotal moment where I felt like in my body at a cellular level that I knew I was done. It was like, like, it was like this breath in and this breath out. And it felt like such this, the most loving thing I could do for our family would to be to separate, Mm -hmm. knowing there would still be consequences of that decision that that doesn't take that away, but knowing that, um, it was just, it was time to go. It was done. Right. Right. Um, what are, what are some of the signs that you, as you help people navigate the choice, what are some of the things that you help them know that, how do you help them know that own feeling in their body of whether it's time to continue working on their marriage or whether it's time to continue, uh, completing their marriage? Right. Okay. There's a, can I give you a few different thoughts? Cause yeah. everyone's different and everyone experiences this particular knowing differently, but genuinely what I would encourage people, first of all, to understand and be willing to take full responsibility for the dynamic of what's happening in their marriage. So like to really, really educate yourself about how the nervous system works. How does the brain work? How does our um, attachment styles work? How is that playing a part in like in the way that you're showing up in your marriage, right? Mm-hmm. How are hormones playing a part? There's yeah. such a double of women in their forties getting divorced. <laughs> yeah. They're, you're speaking my language now. Yeah. It's, like, it's like such a common thing in yes. the room right now. You know, it, it feels like as soon as I mentioned perimenopause on my podcast, I'm getting like a flood of emails and <laughs> like, it's like, oh yeah, this is a problem as well. Like add to it menopause and perimenopause and you know, it, it throws a dynamic in there. It really, really does. And you have to be willing to look at the multifaceted piece. I mean, I'm speaking to women, but for men too, but as a woman, uh, I had navigated having five children in seven years, for example. So I swear I lived in postpartum (laughs) and, and so I, I was aware enough to understand that like, I couldn't make sense of things and I needed a lot of support and help. I got really practiced at taking responsibility, right. Being willing to have the hard conversations. Um, I, I, I developed the, the skill sets in my marriage. Mm -hmm. And so getting to the point of where I knew it was time to go, it's because I, cause I don't believe in I don't know, the thought process of like, oh, there's more I could do. There's mm-hmm. always something more you can do and figure yeah. out. I I was just, I had reached a point in my process where um, I knew that leaving would is, was the right answer. I see, I married, see, I didn't, I, no one gets married to get divorced, right? <laughs> first of all, yeah. no one gets married. So part of that process was too, is I had to kind of deconstruct, mm-hmm. like, I didn't know who I was outside of my marriage. Mm -hmm. I didn't know who I was outside of being a wife, of being a mother. So I had to look at like at the core of my identity Mm -hmm. and knowing that like I never, ever wanted to be the person that I became in order to stay married. That girl was no longer available to me. And that was kind of another sign as well. 
Mm-hmm. Like, okay, it's time to go because how I'm showing up in the marriage is no longer who I'm interested in being. And it's creating too much of a, dy- a dynamic that was creating so much toxic energy in our home. Everything you're saying right now, I'm, I'm just so um, fascinated by that. Like what you are teaching is that you heal your relationship with yourself and your wisdom will start to speak up. I just want to say is that that language and that verbiage is not widely understood what that means. Like, oh, how do you heal your relationship with yourself, right? Because that is a lot of work. In fact, when clients come to me and they want to do all of those things that you mentioned at the beginning, right, of what divorce coaching is, yeah. we always start with like the relationship you have with you. Mm -hmm. because you have the surface level problems, when to start dating, how to make money, all of these things, or how to co-parent, but you'll never be able to outgrow who you think you are. So you're making, even though we can address those surface level problems, if at your core, you think you are unworthy to be loved, you're going to make decisions in your life differently regarding those surface level problems. Right. Yeah. So we, we have to go into those core, I call them core wounds, where all of us I'm not enough. I'm not lovable. I can't have what I want. You know, I don't deserve or I'm not worthy of love. Those are what I mean by the core wounds where on some level, every human on this planet experience, we have to address those first. Yes. When you heal your relationship with yourself, you are naturally going to start mending your relationship with your partner. And if you're supposed to end the marriage, that doesn't mean you're throwing away a relationship. Right. It means that like, that's part of your healing journey together. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that like really drew me to, to you. Just the way you talk about it is full of compassion and love for both partners. It's, it's never like a, um, you know, angry, you know, you're not feeding that so-called toxic energy, right? You're, you're healing, you're continuing to heal it even through divorce. Yes. And I have a little bit of a tough love side to me (laughs) Yeah, because I tell everyone, I said, divorce is not about your ex. You know, one of the practices we learn is like how to reframe your experience because your story needs to be told. A lot of my clients get to the point where they're, the pain is all they have left. So when they hit that point, you have to reframe because that pain can be turned into something incredible and it can be made into something beautiful. It's just not everyone knows how to do that because that pain is so real. That pain reminds them of this is why I got divorced and this is why they left. And this is why I am the way that I am and fingers pointing, fingers pointing. And again, so this, all of these tools I'm explaining to you can be done while in a marriage, right? Yeah. But, you know, but, you know, particularly the the clients that I work with Mm -hmm. is they have to be willing to let go of the pain that is attached to the story. It is a practice. It's not something like, boom, this is my new story. And this is how it is. And this is how I'm seeing it. Right. It really truly is a practice. It's in, I call it, you have to learn how to integrate the healing. You have to learn how to integrate the new approach to your life. Many of the clients I've worked with, they're in a a place where their partner is thinking about leaving them. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much devastation there when when the woman is the the one that wants to heal the relationship and wants to stay. And like, as you were speaking about the pain, I I was starting to think about those those people who are being left and they're just left with like, what the hell? <laughs> what do I do now? And there's so much fear moving forward in yeah. In a, in a new place uh, as most of the time a single mom and you learning how to make money on her own and to, to have the same lifestyle or what would you say to that person who is being left? First of all, like I even get emotional. It's like, like it sucks and it's supposed to suck. Again, going back to no one gets married to get divorced, but to that woman, that was me for three years. So my ex was the one who wanted to divorce. And what I would do, it's not what I would do. Let me get, I'm going to give you a few different thoughts. You want to make sure that you're getting the support and you have to process the fear of it all. Like, so let's just say your, your husband will use women, that dynamic, your husband wants to leave and he's asked for a divorce and you don't want it. 
Well, why would you want to stay with someone that doesn't want you? Is a good question just to ponder, right? And all of the questions that I ask or I'm going to give those who are listening are just, I want them to help you kind of get out of like the stuck mindset. Okay, so let's think beyond, all right, what are you making this mean? What are you afraid of will happen? In fact, processing your fears of someone leaving you or being single, all of that is so, so necessary to just process and to be with the actual fear. And we're not really wired to spend time in that emotion. If you don't know how to be with your fear, if you don't know how to process the fears of your your spouse leaving or your financial fears or, okay, what, how is this going to impact my kids, right? A lot of women stay or they try to force a relationship to work because we don't want it to affect the kids. Well, I spent a lot of time processing just the emotion that was attached to what's going to happen to my kids now. I just had to be with the fear because I couldn't make decisions on what to do until I addressed the fear. I had to be with that part of me. All of us, like it's actually a beautiful part of us because our fear is just information. Our fear is just indicators. It doesn't mean anything unless we give it meaning, of course, but I like to look at fear of like, it. okay, this is just information and you know, I kind of want to give an example just to give this some thought or some context, but I was afraid um, I wouldn't be able to support my kids, for example. Mm -hmm. You can't leave. What are we supposed to do? Right. All the things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I remember just sitting in my chair for one time and I said, no, we're going to feel this because I could feel my brain trying to take me out of it. No, just go clean, go ignore, go do something else. Right. So I sat there very intentionally and I sat with my journal and I just cried and cried. And I mean, I went to every worst case scenario. We're going to be homeless. We're going to live in tent. The government's going to take my kids, like everything known to man. And when I kind of laid it on the table and I just sat with it and I, I spent time with it, it was, it felt very sacred almost. I was witnessing this part of me that was so real and that I didn't know what to do with. So I just sat with it. And it was about 30 minutes. And I was surprised because 30 minutes later, all of a sudden it was like, (gasps) and it was like almost this relief kind of came over me. Like you're going to be okay. Mm. If anyone's going to figure it out, you, you will be able to. And that was the truth, right? So he was telling me that like, there's no way out of this. You're screwed. Your kids are going to (laughs) die. Yeah. Like worst case scenarios. But what what was on the other side of fear was the actual truth was you're going to figure this out. And if anyone can do this, it's going to be you. Right. It was like, that was me, right? That was the actual truth. But in, in order to come to that truth, you had to sit with the feeling of fear. You had to stop running from it, stop ignoring it, stop fighting it. And you had to sit with it. Yeah. And it didn't cause me to want to divorce my husband too. Right. <laughs> it didn't make it didn't make like that decision to stay or go any easier, but yeah. it got, get me to a place of like, I can do this. Mm-hmm. Like I will be okay. Yeah. And that, but what that did is it also gave space for the decision to kind of be more clear. It was still a year later. Like at that point, it was still another whole year in my right. marriage. Yeah. I think, you know, just that process that you're talking about going to the worst case scenario is so important for anyone, no matter what your relationship looks like, Mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, we've been taught as women, especially that our, our relationship completes us and that like, you know, if we're left single or if we're, you know, if we don't have our husbands or especially as women married to men, if we don't have a husband, there's something wrong with us. And and the truth is, and I've often told my clients this, the truth is every relationship ends either through divorce or through death. Like at some point we are going to have to grapple with, oh, I'm alone. And and what does that mean for me? How do I, you know, live my life without this person that I loved for so long, you know? And so I, I, I love that you talked about going to that worst case scenario, because that's how we discover who we are truly, like as an individual and yeah. what we are made of. 
hundred percent. Yeah. We're kind of taught that being alone is bad too. Yeah. Like it's bad. It's not only scary, but it's bad. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and again, there's the, the actual of physicality of being alone. And then there's that internal experience of, mm-hmm. of feeling alone. And I know a lot of women feel alone in their marriages. Mm-hmm. They, they feel alone being married to a partner. And right. I experienced that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, some of that can be like, I mean, I, I have some clients right now whose partners are also going through depression or their own midlife crisis and, and, you know, navigating, like, is my partner totally checked out and should I figure out how to move on? Or right. is this an opportunity for me to hold space for my partner and figure out how to love them, even when my partner is disconnected from me. And that's where, you know, that's where, digging in to find that inner wisdom and like what is best what feels temporary and like I want to help my partner through this and what feels like I'm trying to save something that shouldn't be saved you know that's such a a great question to ponder as half of my listeners are probably pondering yeah and I think speaking to saving something that perhaps that's tricky Right. Because yeah. looking at, I call it my savior complex. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. And let me give you what I mean by that. Because when my husband presented the divorce three years, like I've been divorced for two years. So three, like five years ago, when he first asked for a divorce, and he was telling me how he felt about me and our situation. And I remember thinking, I'm going to prove him wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. So my savior complex kicked in where I needed a like I had this reflex to like, you're wrong about me and I'm going to show you. Right. Mm-hmm. Rather than just letting him have his experience, I tried to prove that I was good enough for him, that um, that I was this X, Y and Z person, like all of the things I tried to just prove wrong mm-hmm. rather than going internally and finding that worth for myself, which I think would have benefited me. But I just didn't have the tools. I didn't have the awareness. I didn't have the skill set. But that's you want to be aware if you're noticing that you have a savior complex where you're trying to make him feel better so that you can feel better about you. Right. Yeah. Holding a space for your partner who's grieving, experiencing depression, a midlife crisis, you need help no matter what, mm-hmm. because you need a support system because it's, it's very challenging to hold the space, but especially if you don't know how to, mm-hmm. and especially if your worth is attached to what's happening for him. Yeah. There's so much of letting go in that situation, yeah. letting go of the need to prove yourself. Yeah. Go of the need to, if I just do this or say this or treat him this way, then maybe he'll like me again. Maybe he'll, yeah. maybe he'll feel better about his own situation. All of that. Like we, I, I love that, that you brought into savior, savior complex because we are taught again, as women to constantly put ourselves under the bus so that we can save somebody else. And yeah, go ahead. And again, well, that just comes from it's very unconscious. So there's no need to beat yourself up if you're finding yourself doing this, Mm -hmm. because it's very much a lot of our worth is found outside of us. At least that's, you know, how we develop and perhaps conditioned Mm -hmm. a lot that, well, if I can't help him, then who am I? Right. And maybe you're not supposed to help him. Maybe part of his journey is for him to kind of figure it out by himself, but then how can you be a supportive partner in those in those moments. And my best advice is like, you learn how to support yourself. Like you really, really just learn how to separate your identity from his experience and his stories and his emotional waves. As if if we're talking about like depression or midlife crisis, because those are big. Yeah. We all are going to go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, no one told the cute little 25 year old that wanted to get married. You know, I'm 43 now. No one told me so long ago that like, you're going to go through these big life changes. Yeah. Like, yeah, we can do anything together. But no, those real big life changes and traumas, mm-hmm. you know, are real. Mm-hmm. I think too, like when we, when we say our vows, we think, you know, through sickness and health, yeah. we think 
cancer or like natural growing old and getting sick and we're going to care for each other. We don't think mental and emotional health, oh, yeah. you know, and how are we going to take care of ourselves in that process as well? You know, yeah. if our partners are going through something like that. Um, and it, it just, it speaks volumes to, or I guess what I'm trying to say is when we, I love what you're saying that when we focus on ourselves, the rest, the rest will fall into place. The rest will, we will find our inner wisdom and get there. Yeah. It's definitely a journey. And I study, I have a little bit of a woo woo side to me. So I love to study things about feminine energy Yeah, and, you know, just kind of going the, the journey for women really is to go inward every Mm -hmm. time and, and really, really get in tune with like your intuitive side and this part of you, that's a gift. And I feel like, um, when you're experiencing trauma in your marriage, a lot of times your intuition is the first thing to go because you're, you become like this high alert, like something's wrong. We have to fix it. And it becomes like this, this, this evil, like necessary, hyper-focused, vigilant thing, because this relationship matters to you. Mm -hmm. And And again, so for those who are listening, like just kind of pay attention to that's why so many women feel like, oh my gosh, I've lost myself where they lose, for example, when they lose themselves in motherhood, right? because they become so hypervigilant on these relationships that matter, Mm -hmm. which is a good thing. It's a gift. But again, when we lose that intuitive side of us or that, that inner compass, we feel lost and, Mm -hmm. and, and we need to spend that time with ourselves. Right. Right. One of the the things that we talked about this earlier, but I want to talk a little bit more about it. Um, Fears of running your kids' lives. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like how, like how have, you know, I'm so curious, like from your perspective, how does it even serve your kids to do what is best for you? How does it serve my kids? Yeah. To do what is best for you. Man. There's, there can be so many stories there. <laughs> uh, okay. I want to, I, I would, I'm trying to think of a real life example because I've had to learn to put myself first. And the way that I do that um, for me is I take care of myself physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually before my kids get up. So, uh, so when, if you can imagine having five kids under seven, that's where I started this journey. Yeah. Is I got up before my kids because I knew my nervous system was so short. Right. <laughs> I'm like so on edge all the time. And and I knew that my cup was empty. So I had to give myself enough space to take care of those basic needs. Mm-hmm. And when those basic needs were in place, I showed up differently as a mom. I was more present. I was definitely more fun. And um and it's really, really easy to get sucked back into like, what, right when you wake up, you hit the ground running, you just hit the ground running. Yeah. And I had to teach myself that like, taking care of myself was the best thing that I could do for my kids, because I showed up differently. I showed up who I wanted to be. I felt like I had more choice. Mm-hmm. And that's where in your power lies. Because when you feel like you don't have a choice, for example, like when I would yell at my kids, when I hit that point and I'm yelling at my kids is because I had no other choice because I was so burnt out. Right. Yeah. And so dissecting like 10 steps before that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Where, like what got me to that place? And it always came back to, I had a need that wasn't being met and I wasn't recognizing it. Mm-hmm. Right. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. Yeah. And you know, I, I I went back and forth in my self-care journey as my kids age. My oldest is, or my youngest is 18 now. And I will admit fully that once they all got to about like 14 and over, it was so much easier to care for myself because I wasn't constantly. And I also, I, I want to correct that a little bit because all of my teenagers went through something hard <laughs> and I felt like it was, um, you know, it was just as hard, if not harder to raise teenagers than it was to to raise toddlers. But like the the time shifted, 
You know, they weren't yeah. constantly waking me up in the in the morning. And and so oh, yeah. I found it easier to find my alone time in the morning. So speaking to people whose children still wake them up in the morning, they still have like an early morning to, to go to. How do you practically, as a mom, navigate time for yourself when your kids are just constantly there? I'm going to go back to my early days because my youngest is still seven. So I'm still getting woken up multiple times a night. And <laughs> so I'm I'm going and I get up at 445 every morning. People are like, you're crazy. I'm like, I know. But I also go to bed early, right? Um, that's key. Yeah, that's key. Like can't take care of yourself at night if you're going to wake up early. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So. When I think about like those early toddler, toddler, toddler years, like with uh, infants, two, three, four, five, I mean, my, my parenting shifted when my youngest could wipe her butt. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, like something, some veil lifted off of me. <laughs> it's like, they don't need me that much, yeah. you know, but I had to, I was very good intentional, like as a parent giving my kids alone time. So mm -hmm. I know you can't really do that all the time with an infant and, you know, early toddler. So I would just put them in a stroller and I'd walk for an hour. And I, that's when I would listen to podcasts or a book Yeah. or, um, I would trade babysitting hours. I mean, I, at the time I was married, so I just asked my husband a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I need time to myself. I need to go to the gym. But what I found worked is I went to the YMCA every single day. So if you could imagine again, five kids under seven, loaded all five up. I went to the YMCA, YMCA every single day and I put them in the gym daycare for two mm -hmm. hours. Yeah. One of those hours I worked out, the other hour I literally went in the mother's room and either cried or napped, journaled, read. <laughs> that is brilliant. Yeah. Because <laughs> they could stay there for two hours and it was the cheapest form of daycare and I was a right. stay-at-home mom and I wasn't working. So that's kind of how I could do that. Uh, you have, there are ways I, I tell women, listen, like there's a million reasons not to do it. You have to, you're the only one in charge of your experience. And there are ways you have to get creative. And that sometimes is a mental load just in and of itself, but there are ways. And that was my own ways because I really needed time to cry. Mm -hmm. I was postpartum. I just, I go to the gym and people would ask like, how are you? And I'm like, that's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta go cry in the bathroom. <laughs> because <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> yeah, yeah I remember those early YMCA days I did not go every day and drop my kids off for two hours but I did go like three days a week yeah. and drop them off for like an hour and that was yeah. such a lifesaver yeah, yeah you have to teach yourself that like you it, so that's kind of the mental piece to it so yeah. mentally I had to spend time with this like teaching myself that it was okay mm -hmm. that my kids didn't need me as much as I thought they needed me mm -hmm. like yeah. those two hours mm -hmm. they were getting snacks they were getting playing mm -hmm. and I'm over here thinking like I'm a terrible mom so I had to spend time dissecting that belief and mm -hmm. teaching myself no this is what actual good moms do is they take care of themselves yeah yeah and I love that piece of like even just trusting that your your kids are resilient and they don't have to have you in their life 100% of the time, every no. single day. <laughs> no. Yeah. And okay. they're also resilient if, if family dynamics change. They are, you know, I think when we think of divorce, we think of how our parents did it. And we think of how, you know, how ugly it was and how everybody was tearing each other apart. And, you know, there's so many other beautiful ways to end a relationship where yeah. the kids can feel nurtured and safe from both parents. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Um, I kind of want to, like, I want to speak to that a little bit because when you, you know, if divorce is on the table and you guys do move in that direction, it's important to make sure like that your kids, because your kids Okay. How do I say this? Let me just breathe for a second. Your kids are going to naturally think it's their fault. That's normal. No matter what, mm -hmm. like kids, because they are wired depending upon their age to look outside of them and decide who they are. So when they're, when their parents are separating, you just want to be mindful that they're having a completely different experience than you think they're having. 
but it, that it's very, very common that they're going to want to blame themselves. And so um, part of, you know, circling back to everything that we've been talking to, you know, being a present mom, knowing how to take care of yourself is going to help you know how to actually navigate your kids through that whole process in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I have another question it, and it it's, it's something that I've come across a couple of times over the, the past year. Um, I know that you have a religious background and, right. and, you know, when someone has a religious background and upbringing and they're, they're still in that and they value marriage above anything. And they're, they're saying, I cannot, you know, God hates divorce, all of that. Like how, what do you, what do you have to say to that person? I have a few different things. I definitely have to, a few different things. If they believe that God hates marriage, we'll start with that belief. God hates divorce. Or yeah. <laughs> I didn't say marriage. <laughs> Gosh. I, I'm that like, would be a different yeah. story. <laughs> right. Well, I would spend time examining your relationship with God. A lot of times people who grow up in religious upbringings, and this is not shaming religion because I think religion has a, a place and its purpose and it's a beautiful thing. There's a lot of good things to it. But when your belief system is that, you know, divorce is of the devil or divorce. I, I mean, I grew up being taught that like when you divorce, like Satan must have gotten to your marriage, you know, it's like yeah, these yeah. very like bold statements. Right. But I would encourage you to examine your relationship with God because a lot of our relationship with God is just like, we're, it's because we're being told something and we don't know why. Right. And so if God is telling you or you believe that, you know, God is like against divorce, I would just question like, okay, then who do you think God is? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, would God want you to stay in a marriage where you are being hit or abused? Is God mm -hmm. going to want us, you to stay in a marriage where your husband is unfaithful? I don't know. Only you can answer that. But when I started examining my relationship with God, for example, I'm going to give some context to this. Yeah. Um, I was the higher desire in my marriage. So I had this very, very high sex drive. And my husband was the lower desire. And I remember because of my cultural upbringing, I felt very ashamed of that. I'm like, God, why would you make me this? Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I'm over here and my husband doesn't want to have sex with me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I'm like, you know, I'm having this, you know, back and forth because I felt ashamed. And so that kind of put, kicked me into gear of like, God, why would you make me like this? Mm -hmm. And I had to start examining who I believe God was in my life. If I believed he was this punishing God or someone who is um, out to make sure that I have to prove myself to, I, it would like kind of just blew me wide open when I'm being told, no, your sexuality is a beautiful gift that you have. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but that's not what my church is teaching me. Mm -hmm. My church is teaching me that this part of me is like hush hush and it's not a good thing. And we don't talk about it and we don't express it. Right. You know, and so separating your relationship with God versus like your religious beliefs are, those are two different things. And that's actually a very hard journey, especially mm -hmm. if you grew up in a very like high demand religion, which I did. Yeah. Yeah. So did I, I grew up in, in, um, a very, um, fundamentalist Christian church. And so like, I had to go through the same journey of like, how do I separate my religion from what I believe? And my beliefs have went all over the place. <laughs> and, and I think, and, and then I started finding beauty in that journey and that it was, it was a beautiful thing to discover God on my own and my beliefs on my own outside of what the church taught me. Yeah. And, and again, it's very scary. Like, looking at this part of us because it's just something we've always taught and believed. So then when you start to question it, I think questioning and doubt is a beautiful gift. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's no question that God can't handle. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of that journey for me is I, I did have to, um, because that was one of my fears, then what's going to happen to my family, mm -hmm. right. From an eternal perspective, yeah. like, I was taught that the family unit consists of a mother, a father, and kids, 
time and all eternity, right, was the words that we use. And okay, so now what? Now where do I fit in God's plan when I'm when I'm no longer in this family unit? Mm -hmm. And that was really the only reason it felt scary to look at because I had I didn't know who to talk to about it. And all of a sudden, my questions could not be answered within the church that I was raised in. Mm -hmm. And so I had to start looking outside of that, which, again, this high control church that I was raised in, that was like frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Right. And so finding a community that was going to support me in that spiritual growth. So for the, you know, who are worried about that spiritual piece to them. There are, find someone who's gone before you, ask the questions, ask the hard questions, ask the questions that you are unwilling to ask. Right. Yeah. That's so beautiful. So good. I want to go back. I know we only have a few more minutes left, but I want to go back to what you said in the beginning that when divorce is an option, it makes your yes more powerful. Yeah. So about that. Well, because your power lies in your choice. Mm -hmm. When we think we don't have a choice, we feel hopeless. We feel like we're not, we feel weak, right? Well, I don't have any other choice, right? Then in comes obligation. And then usually after obligation comes resentment and we're, all of this stuff builds up with inside of us. But when you understand that you're yes, because you have the option to leave, like that makes your yes to stay way more powerful, right? And I've experienced that. I, I mean, I even remember when I decided, I was like, you know what? This I'm staying no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I said, in order for me to stay, this is what needs to happen. X, Y, and Z, right? I got, mm -hmm. I was very honest with myself. I got all the support that I needed. I lasted in that decision for two months. And trust me, I felt so powerful. I'm like, okay, I'm staying and this is all I need. And this is what needs to happen. And I got through like about two or three months. And then I realized okay, no, like that's when I knew it was time to go. Like, because I went, like I honored my yes, I supported myself in that decision. And then the clarity came mm -hmm. yeah. and that made me, that gave me the option to leave with so much grace and like so much compassion on myself and my ex-husband. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I could see him, you know, I respected him like through the process. Like it just gave me, I don't know, the clarity. Right. Yeah, I love that. Um, it, it's something similar happened to me, even though my marriage took a different trajectory. I started feeling resentment because of all the things I was doing and all the ways I was neglecting myself. And I thought it was my husband's problem <laughs> or my <laughs> husband's fault. And, you know, and like, and I, there for a little bit, I really wanted out. I just, I wanted independence. I wanted out. But I knew I like, I was just like, oh, that's not an option. That's not an option. Keep going, keep going. And when I, when I paused for a minute and said, wait a second, what if it was an option? Yeah. Like, what do I really want? What does my soul really want? And that's when I started like really falling in love with him again, because it, it was almost like I, I describe it as like, when there wasn't an option, it was like, I was trapped in a cage, like the door uh -huh. shut. I felt yes. trapped. I had no clue what to do when the door opened and I said, this is an option. I was like, oh, I'm not trapped. I can leave anytime I want. I can have even walk outside of it and say, let's, let's build a better cage, <laughs> right? Let's build a better environment for ourselves. And like, and it was, that was when I really started falling in love with my husband again, like, because it was an option. And so I love that you said that. And it, it's such a powerful thing to remember that we have autonomy over what is best for us. And we have the right to figure that out for ourselves. Yes. And understanding autonomy in a committed relationship, such as a marriage is, is something that you'll practice the entire time because we naturally grow. We naturally change our right. value systems change. We pass through seasons, perimenopause, like we mentioned yeah. earlier, yeah. but when you give yourself like you said, you have no human wants to feel like they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And when you, if you can imagine yourself, like you said, in that cage, your only option is like, how do I get out? How do I get out? And you're like fighting with this like proverbial cage you put right. yourself in. Right. Yeah. But when you realize there is no cage, mm -hmm. right? You're like, oh, it's like this freedom of like, okay, who do I want to be? How do I want to show up in this marriage? Yeah. You know, like yeah. I loved your example. Yeah, beautiful. 
Corey, this was so much fun to have you on here. And I know it's going to resonate with so many people. And I can teach, you know, it's so interesting how we can teach the same things, but hearing it from someone who has actually been through it is so powerful. And I, so I know so many people are going to want to find you. So tell me, tell us where they can find you at. So you can, I mean, you can always email me, Corey at CoreyWoodsCoaching.com. I'm, that's like a direct connection to me, but I think my, my Instagram and my Facebook, I need to work on this. They don't match. It's just Corey Woods on Facebook. And then on Instagram, I have a divorce page, which is healing beyond divorce is my Instagram page that I just started, but most of my content, you'll find me. I write a lot on Facebook. It's been my main platform. Yeah. Okay. Great. And do you have a podcast? I do. Um, it's called Healing Beyond Divorce. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's new too. So there's probably only 10 or 11 episodes. My plan is I need to get a lot more out there, just basic conversations like we have. Mm -hmm. I've just launched it. So it's it's yeah. kind of perfect. Perfect. I, I love uh starting a new podcast when it's new because there's less to catch up on. <laughs> oh yeah. Can I, and just a preface instead of what we, we were talking about and what yeah. your listeners are in the middle of, I did a series on when to know it's time to go. And I have about 10 interviews. Well, like eight interviews, I should say, because everybody's story is so different. And if I can give anyone that perspective is that there's no one formula of how to figure this out. And so that's why I presented it with stories so that people can see that like, okay, one, you're not alone, mm -hmm. right? You've probably experienced, you know, between those eight stories, something that they did, right? And so yeah. they, they're they just giving their stories, which I feel like a lot of people's words can be found in other people's stories. Right. So yeah. that's probably a good resource. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for that. All right, we'll close it out here. Thank you so much, Corey. You're so welcome. Friends, I hope you enjoyed that conversation just as much as I did. Here's what I've learned. No matter where you are in life, we all need support at different times, whether it's to heal your relationship or to discover what's best for you. You do not have to do this alone. So no matter where you're at in your marriage right now, reach out and get the help and support that you need right now. You can email Corey at Corey at CoreyWoodsCoaching.com and she spells her name C-O-R-R-I-E. And you can reach me at hello at RachelCunningham.com. Rachel is spelled with an A-E-L. All right, until next time, friends. Thanks for listening to Joyful Love. If you'd like to know more about my work, come visit me at RachelCunningham.com. That's Rachel spelled with an A-E-L, Cunningham.com.